Well, for starters, I'm going to introduce myself. My name is John Chapin. I'm with a company called Climate Works Heating and Cooling, and I'm here to talk to you today about indoor air quality, uh, mold, and biological contaminants to be specific. How did I come about to uh, wind up talking to you today about indoor air quality? Uh, well, I've spent uh, the better part of the last 20 years uh, in the uh, residential building trades, whether it was uh, doing foundation work or uh, changing a window. Uh, in 2007, I became a certified energy advisor with Natural Resources Canada. I spent five years uh, in a very lucrative uh, grants program doing energy audits. Uh, when that program sort of dried up, I wound up uh, transitioning into the heating and cooling and indoor air quality business. So, what is indoor air quality? Well, um, for starters, um, most people, if they have a problem in their home, they actually they can't pinpoint it. They don't really know what's going on. Typically, they know they just have a problem, but uh, when it comes to uh, uh, really figuring out uh, what the issue is, they, they, they quite frankly, they just can't put their finger on it. Um, some involuntary responses to uh, indoor air quality issues might be sneezing, coughing, itching, uh, tears, dizziness. Uh, things that just uh, sort of start happening a little out of the ordinary and we often don't know why uh, they even happen. Um, when it comes to indoor air quality, people typically uh, don't uh, express uh, the fact that indoor air quality is good. We, uh, we only typically uh, talk about it when it's poor. Whether it might be uh, poor temperature uh, control in a house, uh, poor moisture control, uh, it just People will often uh, uh, express dissatisfaction when uh, when there's you know something something's not right for lack of a better term. Air quality can be categorized by the presence or absence of five things. One of which is gases, uh, vapors, and aerosols. So uh, gases in the air could be um, uh, methane gas, carbon, those sorts of things that are in our, in our air. Uh, the second is minerals and metals, which will be radon. Uh, does anyone know what radon gas is? Uh, if you don't, uh, it's worth checking it out. Um, particulate matter is just stuff in the air, dust, stuff that we wind up breathing. Uh, we've got odors, uh, smells, and biological matter, which uh, for the most part is mold. When it comes to uh, looking at indoor air quality issues, a lot of people tend to blame the the furnace, uh, the air conditioner, uh, the heating and cooling equipment, uh, because that's what's moving air, so that must be the problem. Uh, talking about indoor air quality, uh, we'll talk about air conditioning. When we talk about air conditioning, we're not talking about cooling, but we're talking about conditioning of the air. Um, conditioning of the air has a number of, uh, there's a number of factors that go into it, one of which is uh, filtering out just the stuff in our uh, in our houses, whether it's uh, using a filter or using a uh, HEPA filter, which is that sort of big one there. Um, we can also add uh, humidification to our homes through uh, duct mount humidifiers or just putting humidifiers in bedrooms just to sort of supplement with our humidity. Uh, we can uh, dehumidify as well. Odor removal um, is another thing that we do when we, when we condition our air. Um, we can do that with uh, using our filters, we can use uh, UV lights built into our forced air system, and we can use standalone filters as well. Uh, air velocity, is, uh, air velocity is, is just the movement of air. Uh, when we have bedrooms that have poor airflow or a room in a house that has poor airflow, we always notice it. Um, if, we, uh, if you're sitting beside a vent and the furnace comes on and the air is blowing on your feet and it's uncomfortable, you also notice it. So that's going to contribute to your air quality in the house. And discharge air temperature really just means the temperature of the air in the room. Uh, if, it's, if it's cool uh, or if it's warm, we'll, we'll, dis we'll uh, display dissatisfaction to that. Indoor air quality on the whole is not regulated. Uh, there's no legislation for indoor air quality. So uh, it's hard to actually become certified uh, in, in, as an indoor air quality investigator because there's really no legislation to, to, uh, to warrant the, uh, the certification. Um, so um, 
when it comes to indoor air quality, we just sort of, we have some general guidelines that we use, uh, good building practices, um, uh, just sort of voluntary standards. Um, and, and basically it really comes down to building new homes. Uh, where do we, uh, uh, how do we uh, improve the quality of the home through the construction? The objective of the National Building Code, which is of course what most provincial building codes are based on, uh, except for Quebec, uh, is to limit the probability that a person in the building will be exposed to an unacceptable risk of illness due to, an indoor, uh, due to indoor conditions, due to unsanitary conditions, and due to the release of hazards, uh, hazardous substances from the building. So that's really the only bit of legislation we have in regards to uh, how good the quality or how poor the quality of the air in a building should be. Moving on to molds and biological matter. Um, everyone is exposed to biological pollutants and molds every day of our life. Uh, they exist in this room, uh, they exist outside, they exist in our houses and in our cars. Uh, how they're going to affect us will, will vary based on the types, uh, the species, and what sort of, uh, how, how much quantity we're exposed to. Um, oh, there we go. Some animations. There we go. Biological contaminants contain four basic elements for growth. The first is a food source. So when we talk about mold uh, needing a food source, we could be talking about a dead mouse, we could be talking about a, uh, a meat wrapper left out, food, whatever it might be. They need something to, to, to eat. Uh, mold or biological contaminants also need moisture. So uh, that's pretty self-explanatory. It could be a, a leaky foundation to uh, just vapor that we produce in a house. Uh, they need oxygen. They're a living organism. They need something to, they need to breathe. And they need warmth. When you remove any one of those four uh, elements, you will suppress the growth of molds. So some facts about molds. Um, has everyone finished eating? Got some pictures now? All right. Molds are plant-like organisms living on decomposing matter or on nutrients from living hosts. It's quite a graphic picture. The, the thing that I notice about this picture is that as brutal as that wall is with all that mold, someone actually made their bed, <laughs> you know, and the lamp and the, everything sort of looks in, in pretty good order in there. Molds will grow on dust, dust mites, and, and cockroach feces, skin flakes, and food particles. So cleanliness is one of those things that does help. Spores can lie dormant for, for long periods of time. And just sort of waiting for one of those conditions, waiting for warmth, moisture, a food source uh, to, to start to flourish. Uh, as mold decomposes, it produces a musty smell. Uh, we're all used to that. Uh, I can look at that picture and I can smell that smell. I can picture it. Um, mold uh, reproduces through the production of spores. Uh, indoor environments that are warm and protected from the sunlight are ideal breeding grounds for mold and bacteria. Molds typically, uh, actually molds will not get any nutrients from uh, inorganic materials such as steel, concrete, and glass. Though they can grow as you see on concrete and we've probably seen that in many homes. Uh, types of dead organic matter that will support the growth of molds are, are such things as drywall. And mold growth, uh, they can produce billions of spores per square meter. And last but not least, there are over 100,000 individual species of mold, um, but they're estimated that they're actually 1.5 million uh, worldwide. When it comes to a strategy for preventing uh, mold and biological contaminants, there's really three things we have to do. One is we have to remove the source of the hazard. The second is substitute the source of the hazard and replace it with something less hazardous. And the third is contain the source of the hazard. Uh, so what we're talking about here could be, an example could be a, uh, Hannah, you were talking about a, a leaky basement, leaky foundation. Uh, 
the water leaking in, saturating the carpet, starting to create mold. Well, you know what? The, the, uh, the, the prevention or the, the strategy for that, of course, is to, first of all, remove the carpet, which stinks because you, you, you have to rip up brand new carpet in often, often cases, tear out the drywall, uh, really contain it, get, it get, get rid of it all. Uh, replace the, the hazard with something less hazardous, so it could be uh, uh, a, a new carpeting, new drywall, and then contain the, the, uh, the actual hazard. So take that carpet, put it in a plastic bag, zip it up, get rid of it, get it out of the house. This is a, uh, this is a quote from a uh, famous uh, indoor air quality fellow. If there's a pile of manure in a space, do not try to remove the odor by ventilation, remove the manure. <laughs> So when you're tackling a, an indoor air quality issue or a mold or whatever it might be, always uh, start with uh, three basic uh, processes, one of which is ventilate. Uh, the second is control the moisture and control the temperature. Before you get into costly scientific investigations to figure out what's going on, do these three things. Ventilate, control the moisture, and uh, control the temperature in that space and you'll start to get things back in order. And we talked about ventilating. Ventilating can be as easy as a bath fan or opening a window. Most houses have those. Uh, ventilation can also be a heat recovery ventilator. Heat recovery ventilators are ventilation systems that will, will change the air in a space without losing the heat. Uh, moisture control, we can, we can do that with adding humidity with humidifiers, removing humidity, or also using a heat recovery ventilator, an, another fantastic way of controlling humidity. When it comes to, to uh, moisture control, uh, if you don't know anything about relative humidity, it, it would be worth looking into and, and trying to figure things, uh, sort of wrap your head around it for lack of a better term, and I'm not gonna sit here and talk about it right now because it'll take me two hours. Uh, but relative humidity, you'll see there's, there's a couple of uh, couple things here. Relative humidity, you, you've got, a, you've got a, sort of an optimum zone where humidity should be. It's, sort of, it's between 30 and 55% relative humidity. I know this picture is a little tough to see, but this is over here is where it, when it's really, really dry in a space, and this over here is when it's really, really damp or really moist. Bacteria and viruses grow when it's really dry and they also grow when it's really moist so we can't just sort of dry out the space and hope for the best we, we have to we have to maintain that balance proper uh, removal of, of humidity and proper uh, uh, adding of humidity as well temperature control well we we can do that with our furnace and an air conditioner and, and a good thermostat uh, we can also do that with baseboards uh, fireplaces uh, ductless uh, ductless units and uh, uh, you know window shakers uh, failing to prevent or correct any or, or avoid any indoor air quality problems in a house or in a space will obviously increase uh, the risk of health issues um, you'll have uh, reduced learning and productivity uh, from the occupants in the building uh, you'll have an accelerated deterioration of home furnishings um, whether it's carpeting or flooring or cabinetry or drywall, there were some, some pretty good uh, pictures of drywall there earlier, clearly deteriorated. Uh, there's strained relations with friends and family, uh, colleagues, neighbors. Uh, there will be obviously publicity that won't be great and uh, a, a, a large potential uh, for liability. So uh, somebody was talking earlier about uh, sort of uh, how do you determine at what point? What, at what point do you respond to an issue within a building, within a space? Uh, so I came up with a couple examples uh, of, so basically problems that require a response but do not require immediate attention. So uh, after inspecting uh, a humidifier, you notice that it's got slime and mold and, and junk on it. Uh, what's your your your, uh, your strategy for that? You know what? Clean it, replace it, put in something else, uh, put a maintenance and uh, uh, plan in place, and and move on. Uh, if occupants uh, discover that they're all sharing headaches and uh, they're all nauseous and they're all they they sort of share a lot of the same symptoms. Well, these things are not life threatening uh, 
issues. Uh, they're, they're worth addressing, but but you know, don't jump out of bed and do it right now. Make an appointment next week. Um, immediately after delivering uh, some new uh, flooring cabinets, whatever it might be, uh, the occupants in the building uh, expressed that, that some discomfort. Well, it's probably off-gassing from the actual, uh, uh, maybe the, the, the glue in the cabinets, maybe it's the, uh, the carpeting themselves. Again, it's worth the dressing, uh, but not, a, not an enormous deal. Uh, a local news article suggests that some buildings in the area have high radon levels. You know what? Have the building tested and, and uh, put in some ventilation. I'm big on ventilation. You can solve a pile of issues with ventilation. And if, if, if ever in doubt, add ventilation, you can't go wrong. Uh, you wonder what, if some old piping has some asbestos uh, or there's vermiculite in the attic. Again, you can have the area tested, but start to ventilate. You can't go wrong by having fresh air in the house. Uh, problems that require immediate action. People have complained about headaches, nausea, and combustion uh, odors. Um, it's very possible there's some carbon monoxide poisoning going on, maybe some combustion gases uh, spilling into the house. As we make our uh, buildings more energy efficient, we, we tighten up the building envelope, we actually limit the natural air changes that happen in the space. And so we start to contain a lot more of the, the bad stuff that would naturally leak out. Uh, so uh, again, ventilate and get rid of those natural draft appliances that cause those issues. Uh, one or more of the occupants in the building have been diagnosed with Legionnaire's disease. Legionnaire's disease, for those that don't know it, is a very severe form of pneumonia caused by bacteria. Uh, so if that happens, you know, it's, it's a potentially life-threatening illness. It's worth addressing right away. Get involved with a health department, uh, a doctor, uh, anyone in sort of a more of a professional manner. And occupants report uh, that water from a roof has, has, uh, has leaked and it, it's flooded a portion of the carpeting. Again, if you can't dry out that carpeting, rip it out, start over dry out the area, make sure it's nice and clean. If it requires ripping out drywall and, and insulation and starting over and all the studs, it's a pain in the butt, but do it. Uh, you have to get that area dry. Um, there's one thing that I've always learned uh, from all my courses in indoor air quality, uh, from doing all the energy audits and, my, and all the sort of the, the consultations I do all the time is that it, it's far cheaper to prevent the problem than to have to address it and fix it later. It always is. Uh, in, in virtually every instance, it'll be much less expensive to do it, uh, to, fit, to, to prevent it than to, to, to have to fix it. Which, basically, the thought I'm gonna leave you with, it's cheaper to keep the contaminant out than to take it out. <laughs> Thanks very much.